Tonight, tough talk on steel. We believe that these tariffs need to be lifted. But for all that's at stake, no deal yet. Why the new NAFTA hangs in the balance. WhatsApp is so pervasive and they don't know what to do about the spread of misinformation. Weaponizing social media in India's election campaign. Are there lessons for Canada? This is now really on the line in a way that it hasn't been before. And new efforts to criminalize abortion in the U.S. How some states are chipping away at hard-won rights. This is The National. The three-country impasse began last June and it's barely moved since. Now, suddenly, the United States says resolving its tariff dispute with Canada and Mexico is a priority. And Mexico says it's optimistic. But after talks today, Canada's negotiator is keeping her cards very close to the vest. You'll recall that Donald Trump hit Canada with tariffs nearly a year ago. 25% on steel, 10% on aluminum, widely seen as leverage in ongoing NAFTA talks. To justify them, the U.S. claimed Canadian imports posed a national security threat, something Ottawa has called absurd, insulting, and illegal. Canada retaliated with its own tariffs on steel, aluminum, and a long list of consumer items. And so that's pretty much where things have more or less, more or less stood ever since. Katie Simpson explains why that may change and why Canada could hold a crucial bargaining chip. It has been a productive day here in Washington. But uh, more productive days are going to be needed to end the bitter tariff fight with the U.S. The foreign affairs minister used a series of high-level trade talks to remind her American counterparts Canada will not ratify the new NAFTA unless the White House backs down. As long as the tariffs remain in place, uh, ratification would be very, very problematic. The warning may finally be getting through to the Trump administration. After both Canada and Mexico made the same threat, the Mexicans Maybe. say the U.S. <laughs> appears yeah. willing to make They're some concessions. Yeah, very quickly we have made a tremendous progress and I'm looking to an early resolution uh, on the basis of lifting the tariffs, no quotas. He says if Mexico does more to prevent cheap steel from being dumped into the U.S., a deal can be reached without quotas that would restrict how much steel and aluminum can be shipped into America. Freeland wouldn't say if Canada was offered the same deal. The Canadian position remains as it has been from the very outset, uh, that we believe that these tariffs need to be lifted. The face-to-face -face meetings come a week after the Prime Minister spoke with President Trump about the issue twice over the phone and a chat yesterday with Vice President Mike Pence. A sense of urgency also appears to have taken over the administration. Ambassador Lighthizer is in active discussions. Uh, the President has instructed us to try to figure out a solution. I think we are close to uh, an understanding with Mexico and Canada. Publicly, Canada is not as optimistic. Sources say negotiations will become even more intense over the next week, but no deal is expected in the immediate future. Ultimately, Donald Trump is the one who's going to decide whether these tariffs stay or go. And as Canadians saw during NAFTA negotiations, the president isn't always on side with his own team, nor is he predictable. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, late this evening, there was a dramatic and unexpected development from Donald Trump's White House. Nothing to do with tariffs, but was there ever a Canadian connection? Paul Hunter is here to fill us in. So, Paul, what did the U.S. president do? He has pardoned Conrad Black. That's right, fully. Toronto's own Lord Black of Cross Harbour, the one-time media baron in charge of hundreds of newspapers in North America and around the world. In 2007, famously, he was convicted of mail fraud and obstruction and imprisoned in Florida for three and a half years. Indeed, CBC News was outside the prison when he went in to begin serving his sentence. And when he was released, he was deported to Canada. But back before that time, while living in Florida, he was a neighbor of then-citizen Donald Trump. And in the time since Trump was elected president, Black has authored a book, a president like no other, deemed not exactly critical of Trump.
late tonight from the White House. Word Trump has granted executive clemency for Black. In a statement, the White House calls Black an entrepreneur and scholar who's made tremendous contributions to business as well as to political and historical thought. In a statement of his own, Black said he got a call from Trump Monday of last week letting him know. Writes Black tonight, Trump told him none of the, quote, supportive things he'd written about him had anything to do with it. Bottom line, Conrad Black pardoned tonight by Donald Trump. Adrian. All right. Thanks, Paul. Ketchikan, Alaska is a pretty small place coming to grips with a big loss. Two float planes loaded with cruise ship passengers collided on Monday. Six people died, including a Canadian woman, two members of her family, and a local pilot. As the investigation into just what happened unfolds, local residents are in mourning, and Briar Stewart tells us they're also worried that tragedy may scare away the visitors. Float planes took off and landed near the shores of Ketchikan today, part of life on a remote and rugged Alaskan island. But all around are the reminders of Monday's deadly accident. Our uh, visitor industry is hugely important to the community. Many people are employed in it. And the idea that uh, a dream vacation goes awry is just certainly not anything anybody wants to see happen. But it did. Six died, including 37-year-old Elsa Wilk of Richmond, B.C. She worked in the tech sector and had been on board one of the planes with her husband and brother, both Americans. All of them were killed. Friends say she just got married last year. My understanding was that it was, um, it was a, a farewell trip before they moved down to Salt Lake City to start a, a new life for themselves. Such, um, yeah, so, so tragic, really. The pilot of her plane, Randy Sullivan, was also killed. Really Jensen was. Willingham worked with him. Got to fly with him a lot and just got to know him as a really, really cool person and um, somebody I looked up to a lot. So um, trying to stay strong and support the family. He's one of hundreds who turned up at a local hotel fundraiser today. All of the money spent on meals is going to support Sullivan's family. We are booked up all night, yeah. and this is a big part of it. Staff put out the word late last night and were fully booked with reservations by this morning. We hope we, we can put a lot in the bank for them to help them out. So Billy Joe and Tim Lewis think they'll be able to raise at least $20,000 for Sullivan's family. I'm married with three children, and Billy Joe's married with a, ch with a child, and I can't imagine what his family's going through. They're trying to help out one family that's experienced so much loss, knowing that there are many others also now grieving. And Breyer joins us now from Ketchikan. So, Breyer, I, I gather the NTSB, the National Transportation and Safety Board, gave a briefing recently. What are they saying? Well, they're really talking about the status of the investigation, Adrian, and right now they're trying to recover the plane. So the one plane they were able to lift out of the water and put on a barge, but the second plane, that Beaver aircraft, uh, it's much more challenging because the debris field is just so large and parts of that plane uh, are in the water and also scattered on the mountainside. So once they do gather all the pieces they can, they're going to take them back to a secure facility and basically try to reconstruct the planes to figure out just what happened. They've also been able to, to speak with some of the passengers who survived the crash as well as the pilot uh, of the otter plane who survived as well. Now I did speak with a local tourism official who said that a lot of the aviation companies in Ketchikan that operate these float plane trips have been getting calls from cruise ship passengers with questions about safety and, and whether or not they can cancel but she really did stress that hundreds of these book, uh, trips are booked every summer and, and accidents like this as tragic as they are she says that they're still very rare. Okay, Briar, thanks very much. It was exactly two months ago today that a terror attack at two mosques in New Zealand was live streamed online and then that horror shared repeatedly on social media. Today, in response, a dozen world leaders and tech giants came together in Paris. So you're talking Facebook, Twitter, Google, Microsoft and Amazon said they are, quote, resolute in our commitment to ensure we're doing all we can to fight the hatred and extremism that led to terrorist violence. 
The companies have committed to cooperating with the governments of New Zealand, Canada, Britain, France and a few others to develop shared technology, create crisis protocols and then set limits for users spreading hate. After making a stop at the Notre Dame Cathedral, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau went to that Paris summit and the CBC's Salima Shivji was there. A quick visit touring an old Gothic treasure ravaged by fire. Canada will stand uh, with France uh, and uh, ensure that we offer all the support, whether it's steel uh, or wood uh, or whatever help we can. The Prime Minister also pledged another kind of help today for a very modern problem, this time the spread of online hate. Justin Trudeau is among friends here, like-minded leaders all promising to do more in the wake of the deadly Christchurch attack, the horror live-streamed for all to see. Never before have countries and tech companies come together in the wake of a horrific attack to commit to an action plan that will deliver collaboratively. New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern acknowledged the pledge is only a first step, a voluntary agreement that social media platforms are supporting, but with the notable absence of a big player. For Canada's Liberal government, it was important to show up. It's about Canada demonstrating global leadership and saying, look, we will not tolerate online hate, we will not tolerate extremism or terrorism. Asserting leadership on this stage in the hopes, senior Liberals tell CBC, it may translate back home, where the Prime Minister's reputation as a leader has taken a major hit. This is a, an effort to re-establish his, his liberalness in a way, that he is this liberal global leader uh, in a world that, that seems uh, under threat, that you've got you know, populist and, and sort of authoritarian leaders emerging. Trudeau will be back here in France next month and again in late summer with a G20 trip to Japan in between. More opportunity to try and remind Canadians of his international reputation. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Paris. The conversation about online hate crime is happening at so many levels. Just a few weeks ago, Stats Canada started publishing precisely that kind of data. Between 2010 and 2017, 364 police reported hate crimes fell under the category of cyber crimes, uttering threats being the most common type. As for the victims, Muslims were targeted most often, 17% of the time, followed by people in the LGBTQ, Jewish and black communities. Now, stopping the spread of fake news on social media is also an enormous challenge for governments around the world, including in India, where the general election campaign has entered its fifth and final week. WhatsApp is the most popular messaging platform there, about 200 million users, but it's also become a vehicle for misinformation and propaganda. CBC News is in New Delhi as Indians elect a new parliament, and Nala Ayed discovers how they're coping with their social media concern. This in 2019 could be anywhere. But with the biggest ever election in the background and with fake news right up front, India in 2019 may have a message or two for the rest of us. It isn't everywhere, of course, that fake news can be deadly. The most egregious example, a video warning of imminent child abductions, led to the lynching of at least two dozen people. Turns out they were wrongly identified. The video taken from an awareness campaign in Pakistan. Key to spreading it here, ordinary people sharing it on WhatsApp. A major source of news here and a conundrum for the authorities when messages lead to violence. Uh, we have the highest number of internet shutdowns in the world today. Um, only because WhatsApp is so pervasive and they don't know what to do about the spread of misinformation. Meet Rajat. Pressured repeatedly to act, WhatsApp reached out on traditional media. Share joy, not rumors. It also limited forwards to just five at a time and required users' permission before they're added to groups. But in every political war room here, WhatsApp is now a central political tool. Tailored messaging, crucial to each campaign and a rich source of nightmares. That's where the IT cell comes in. It plays a major role, major role in like debunking fake news and a major role in like 
propagating party ideology or government work. So yeah, the battle is still on. Then there is Modi who... With cyber troops pumping out misinformation long before the election, this digital newsroom started a fact-checking squad. Yeah, he, you can hear him saying... They verify the words of politicians, but violent videos on social media are a priority. Videos with a lot of violence sort of spread faster than anything else could. It's super viral. Then we get into it ASAP and you know deploy all our resources onto that. We've seen some mainstream media organizations go from this is fake, so we're not going to touch it, to this is fake, which is why we are going to touch it. Even if one person is voting based on fake information, we think it's a disservice to democracy. And so yet others have taken a message of caution into their neighborhoods. Mob lynching. And a mob lynching in a basement center normally used for dance classes, we met residents who've been trained in workshops funded by WhatsApp. Shivanji Garji, just 17, says she now alerts friends and family to fake news. A responsible citizen. The modest aim is to train 100,000 in a country of 1.3 billion people. The faint hope is that their message goes viral too. Nala Ayed, CBC News, New Delhi. Canada's federal election is just five months away. The government says it's a positive thing that WhatsApp is limiting how users can forward messages to cut down on the spread of information. But the minister says Canadians also have a responsibility. Canadians, whether it's, some, it's information that they're seeing on um, publicly facing pages or in internal group chats, should always take a moment to pause, to look at the source and to question the validity of what they're seeing. Ottawa will spend $7 million to help teach Canadians about online content designed to deceive them. Part of a plan to fight election interference this fall. Now, tomorrow is Election Day in Newfoundland and Labrador. Four parties are in the running, but it's shaping up to be as a tight race between the incumbent Dwight Ball and the Liberals and Chess Crosby, leader of the Progressive Conservatives. Their campaigns have been defined by promoting their visions of a better future, even as the province's debt rises to historic levels. As Chris O'Neill Yates tells us, some voters want to hear more truth and a lot fewer promises. Music is the connective tissue of this province. A close second, politics. That's certainly true of former Great Big C Band member Bob Hallett. He's keeping a close eye on this election campaign. You know, I'm fully invested in this, in this place, in this town, in this province. And he's especially concerned about the province's financial situation. It's dire. The province is mired in record debt, $23 billion for a population of about half a million. Yet all parties are running on platforms of big spending. Both parties have come forward with programs that are utterly unrealistic, if not impossible, if not fantasy, in our present financial circumstances. Jobs and the economy top the list of voters' concerns. Luke Batcock says many students feel they have no job prospects here. People aren't, are, are concerned, but they don't think any of the parties have a real solution. And they think that all of the parties are kind of phony. They think that all of the parties just want to get elected again. Many students must leave the province to pay off their debts after graduation. It takes an average of 14 years in Newfoundland and Labrador for people to be able to pay off their student loans. That kind of delays everything else that people want to do, like starting a family or buying a house. Or Lori Leotes ran unsuccessfully for the Liberal nomination in St. John's Centre. Voters were angry, she says. Um, I've been on the doors and elections, you know, for about 20 years now. And the one thing that really stuck out this election was the concept that we've got four parties and no one to vote for. Uh, I think there's That could result in low voter turnout. You know, we've got a populace that's more educated than ever, more literate than ever, and got constant access to information on politics online. Um, so I, I think that is the source of, of a lot of the anger that's out there right now. And what we desperately need now in Newfoundland is honest, realistic, contextual, thoughtful government. Voters are looking for a change of tune in their provincial politics. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, St. John's. Some other stories we're following tonight, including Donald Trump's new executive order effectively clearing the way for a U.S. ban on Huawei.
The president today declared a national emergency and then barred American companies from using telecommunications equipment made by firms posing a risk to national security. That is meant to protect technology from so-called foreign adversaries. Government agencies now have 150 days to work out exactly how to enforce that plan. The foreign minister of the Philippines says Manila is recalling its ambassador and consuls from Canada over the issue of Canadian garbage. Now, you may remember the shipping containers filled with rotting trash that ended up there six years ago. There was a deadline of May 15th for the trash to be shipped to Vancouver, but the Philippines says Canada missed it. Still ahead on the national, Alabama just passed the strictest abortion law in the United States, and it's not the only state moving in that direction. We will show you the battle playing out in Missouri. But first, we are in Milwaukee as the next round of the NBA playoffs tips off, and where even the radio stations have a message for Raptors fans. I don't have to worry about Toronto too long because they're only going to be in our lives for about a week and a half or so. Mm -hmm. We're not we're not playing, you know, Drake music. We're taking a break, break from, from Drake, Drake. Break from Drake. Turns a corner for the win. There it is. Cannot get enough of that. Kawhi Leonard's stunning buzzer-beating jump shot on Sunday, sending the Raptors to Milwaukee for the Eastern Conference Finals against the Bucks. An excruciating moment before it was then a thrilling one. Almost four million Canadians saw that ball go in. The biggest Canadian audience ever for an NBA game. Now, if fans didn't already see him this way, that shot made Kawhi Leonard a kind of basketball god. But... The Bucks have a god of their own, and the Raptors are going to have to find a way around him to keep their championship dreams alive. Our Greg Ross is in Milwaukee to explain the power of the man they call the Greek freak. So would he eat this many? Cooking up some of his favorite dishes. So this is Giannis's favorite dish when he comes in, yeah. the lamb chops. The lamb chops. At his favorite place to eat, the Omega Greek restaurant here in Milwaukee. Here we go. Up. This is what he likes. I think he singed my eyebrows off there. <laughs> Where he has a favorite drink and even a favorite seat. <laughs> so this is with the table that Giannis likes to sit yeah, at. Yeah, yeah, this is the one. Manager George Flores it. says when Giannis Antetokounmpo shows up, so do the fans. Last time he was here, there was a lot of people here, you know, when they know when he's here. Do you have to keep the people away? Do you have to tell them, let him eat his dinner? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, he's a really nice guy. You know, he's really, I mean, very, very polite. Nice show and go by Giannis. More than anything, they love him for lifting a franchise that made the playoffs just three times in the decade before he arrived. Now, the Bucks are in the NBA semifinals after finishing the regular season with the best record in the league, thanks large in part to the player who's been all but deified. He brought life to the city. The Bucks was down for so long, and he was the savior. So, you know, <laughs> you know, he, he's like the God right now. <laughs> The Canucks yeah. are coming! The Canucks are coming! The Canadians are everywhere! <laughs> coming, Still, guys. some in this city are looking for any way to derail uh, oh, Toronto's oh, oh, momentum. Oh, Break from Drake! Break from Drake! Break from Drake! I visited a local radio station that has gone so far as to ban songs by the Raptors' biggest fan, Drake himself. It hurt my heart, but we had to drop him. He's got to go. He's got to curse. But if Milwaukee is trying to send Toronto a message, Toronto, with the world's largest Greek population outside of Athens, has one for Milwaukee and its superstar. Maybe the freak should be playing in Toronto. What better place for a Greek basketball player to be than, than Toronto? I think there's more Greek support here for him. I think uh, there's more fans, of, of course, for him. Uh, at least 150,000 Greeks are going to be cheering for him. That's for sure. So with the battle lines drawn, Bucks fans here in Milwaukee, just like Raptors fans in Toronto, are dug in deep to watch and cheer. Greg Ross, CBC News, Milwaukee. Still ahead on the National, our dispatch from Missouri. Just the latest U.S. state where abortion rights are colliding with politics and religion. The goal is to save as many lives as possible, but if it's going to uh, set a tidal wave and you know ripple effect of different states looking to us for guidance and attacking Roe v. Wade on that basis, I'm all for it. A life is a life, and um, 
even if it is, um, its origins are in very difficult situations, uh, that life is still precious. Alabama has adopted the country's toughest abortion restrictions, effectively banning the procedure unless the mother's life is in medical danger. Senators rejected exceptions for victims of rape or incest, even if they're underage. You just aborted the state of Alabama because you don't care nothing about babies having babies in this state being raped and incest. Today, the governor signed it into law. A doctor who performs an abortion could now face 99 years in jail. It is all part of a larger movement. We can't get a heartbeat bill until we get Roe versus Wade revisited and turned over. Court challenges are said to be inevitable because current federal law forbids putting an undue burden on a woman who seeks an abortion before the fetus could survive outside the womb. Now, Missouri is another state where lawmakers are targeting abortion rights. Lindsay Duncombe went there to see how that fight is playing out. So she has our dispatch from St. Louis. Outside the only abortion clinic in Missouri. Have a good afternoon. Maggie Tebow's warmth is strategic. We have one person, one person in a vest with a, a friendly smile and a wave that's not threatening because we're not here to threaten her. Hey, how's it going today? I just got a coupon to pass along for a free pregnancy test. The goal is to direct women to free care at a pregnancy center that counsels against abortion. This particular card is for a different clinic, a specific clinic. But if this clinic isn't meeting her needs, well, let me tell you, Lindsay, I've got a whole pamphlet of information with a lot of different places that might be able to help her with what she is facing. We, including adoption, housing, a maternity shelter. What, what does that mean? Are those places where pregnant women can stay if they don't have a home? Definitely. The St. Louis Coalition for Life says it's prevented more than 2,000 abortions here since 2011. I do not want any woman who lives in Missouri to have to get an abortion or to think she has to get an abortion. It's one sidewalk in front of one clinic in the middle of America, but what's happening here, car by car, represents a larger anti-abortion push in the United States. In many states, that momentum is changing laws, making abortions tougher to get. And you're listening to St. Louis Public Radio. Driving past the sidewalk activists is just part of the morning routine for Dr. Colleen McNicholas. She performs abortions at the St. Louis Clinic, as well as facilities in Kansas and Oklahoma. Missouri is now and actually has been for a very long time one of the most hostile states towards abortion rights and abortion, abortion access. So how hard it is depends on a variety of things, right? It depends on where you live. It depends on how much money you have. It depends on your education level, your transportation. Obtaining an abortion in Missouri could get even harder, if not outright impossible. The Missouri legislature is expected to vote this week on the Missouri Stands for the Unborn Act. It would make abortion illegal as soon as a fetal heartbeat or brainwave activity is detected, defined in the bill as between six and eight weeks into pregnancy. Pregnancy. It is essentially a total ban on abortion, right? So the vast majority of pregnant patients don't know that they're pregnant until beyond six weeks of pregnancy. To present it as anything other than that is really just misleading and insincere. Four states have passed so-called heartbeat bills this year, and a fifth is speeding through the Louisiana legislature. That's on top of Alabama's new law that's even more restrictive. All of these laws will be challenged in court, but that's exactly the point. I am pro-life and I will be appointing pro-life judges. Donald Trump promised to put anti-abortion justices on the Supreme Court. He got pro-life votes and in return, those voters believe they got their men. I, Brett M. Kavanaugh. And a conservative court that could revisit, even overturn, Roe v. Wade, the 1973 ruling that legalized abortion in the United States. One of the new restrictive state laws could be challenged all the way to the Supreme Court, including Missouri's. The man behind the Missouri Stands for the Unborn Act is a bluegrass blaring Catholic millennial. Nick Schroer says the reason he went into politics decision. was to restrict abortion mostly, laws. You know, certain issues. The goal is to save as many lives as possible, but if it's going to uh, set a tidal wave and you know ripple effect of different states looking to us for guidance and attacking Roe v. Wade on that basis, I'm all for it. 
I believe that all life is sacred, and so we need to protect that life. This is what debate about abortion legislation in the Missouri Senate looks like. Politicians sharing personal experiences with unwanted pregnancy. So the baby was aborted. Do you know where my niece is now? In a mental institution in Nebraska. That's very sad. She has never recovered from the tragedy of killing an innocent unborn child. There is a Republican supermajority in both houses and a Republican anti-abortion governor. Democrats can only delay and hope to amend the legislation. Democratic Senator Jill Shoup worries Americans who believe in a woman's right to choose have taken that right for granted. I think with the change in our administration uh, at the federal level and the change in the Supreme Court, um, this is now really on the line in a way that it hasn't been before. So we can no longer stand by and allow that complacency to continue. So the handmaids suit up. Thank you. Pro-choice activists fill the state house rotunda, <laughs> hoping their chance will change legislators' minds. I was here about two months ago testifying against these bills. Among them, Ivania Woods. When Brett Kavanaugh was elected to the Supreme Court, she decided to start telling her story. At 28, a student with little money, she terminated her pregnancy. When I was researching my options and looking at, you know, how much I could get in, um, through public assistance, even that wasn't even enough for one child to uh, get through. And so I was like, there's no way I can do this on my own. It's emotional in the sense that it makes me very angry. Right? It makes me angry that I have to be here. It makes me angry that I even have to do this. If Roe versus Wade is overturned, activists acknowledge abortion is likely to be legal in some states, not in others. Doctors warn that's dangerous. I fortunately am young enough that I didn't have to see women dying uh, in the hospital wards from their self-managed abortion. Um, I. I think um, people will travel, people will find a way. Already there's a billboard on Missouri's border with Illinois advertising safe abortion, an emotional, political dividing line in a divided country. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, St. Louis, Missouri. Seven states have passed laws this year to restrict access to abortion. That includes the four states Lindsay mentioned where heartbeat bills were recently passed. As we saw, Missouri will join them shortly and Louisiana should follow and there's more to come. Last month, Tennessee passed an abortion ban, but it would only come into effect if the Constitution is amended to give states full authority or if the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade. Lawmakers in two other states have passed new measures, but they're unlikely to go forward. Critics dismiss them as political distractions. So with abortion being legally restricted in so many states, what happens to those who need one? Because the need doesn't simply disappear. Women have always found a way. And studying Google searches helps understand how. An American researcher looked at the term self-induced abortion, found search rates for it steady until 2007, then jumping 40% in 2011. That's the year various U.S. states enacted a record number of abortion restrictions. These searches still spike in places with the toughest laws. Those who look find answers. We built the mobile clinic. Dr. Rebecca Gompertz of the Netherlands runs a ship that's a mobile abortion clinic taking it near jurisdictions where the procedure is illegal. We are here in solidarity. Recently, her group began providing prescriptions for abortion medication. Foreign pharmacies fill them, send them to the U.S. in the thousands. But is this legal? State laws vary. The FDA sent Gompertz a cease and desist letter. She says she won't stop. I'm a doctor. I um, might have a, a medical duty to help people that are uh, asking, that are needing in medical care. And so uh, I won't turn away women when they need help. As it stands, there is a federal law that prohibits importation of um, pharmaceuticals to the U.S. without a prescription. The FDA, which is the agency that oversees that law, has some latitude in how they enforce it or not. 
There's a growing network of activists ready to help, apps to counsel people on what to do, and an increasingly busy California legal team advising women who are charged or afraid. These restrictions are political, and they have nothing to do with proper medical practice. In 2019, the back alley has moved online. Finally, a note from this country. Today, Ontario's highest court ruled that doctors must give referrals for medical services like abortion or assisted death, even if those services clash with their religious beliefs. Ahead on The National, bringing the past to life, how the legacy of the Winnipeg general strike continues to live on 100 years later. How more interested are people in this right now, given it's the centennial? Um, actually, a lot. We've been booking since January which is very exciting. People will really want to learn more. I haven't heard a whole lot of, I can't believe they did this. It's normally like, good for Winnipeg, way to go. <laughs> but first, here's a look at a story we'll bring you in the coming days on The National as we wrap up our series on guns in Canada, this time with a focus on community and the impact of gun violence. Here's a preview. When kids are not given opportunities, it's school to jail pipeline. These kids are getting targeted by these big wig drug lords who are targeting them when they are young and training them how to get into this lifestyle, which appears glamorous until they actually get into it and realize, I gotta keep one eye open with a gun under my pillow. I don't believe anyone is born with hate in their heart or that anybody wants to hurt people. I think that's something that's bred, something that's, uh, you know, beat into our heads. I, I was bullied and I was a victim long before I was a gangster. And it led me to see that, hey, you know what? These guys that bully me seem to have some respect, some prowess, and I want that. I want people to respect me. You learned how to become the bully. I learned how to become the bully, yeah. You saw earlier in the show that Christia Freeland was in Washington today. Now she's on her way to Cuba. The foreign minister is set to discuss the political crisis in Venezuela and the strained U.S.-Cuba relationship. This is the first trip by a high-ranking Canadian government official since Justin Trudeau was there in 2016. This is a national problem with a, an extraordinary focus here in British Columbia. We believe it's our obligation to get answers to those questions. And that is BC's Premier announcing a public inquiry into money laundering. This follows explosive reports showing how more than $7 billion of dirty money has made its way into the province's economy. More than $5 billion is believed to have gone through the real estate market, driving up housing prices by around 5%. Now today, Winnipeg is marking one of the seminal strikes in Canadian history. A hundred years ago, tens of thousands of workers walked off the job in what would come to be known as the Winnipeg General Strike. Largely left to the past, interest in its history is being revived. And as Cameron McIntosh shows us, its ramifications are still being felt today. All right, so welcome to the strike tour, everyone. A walk through time. Sabrina Janke is bringing a turbulent chapter of Winnipeg's past to life. And then what happened in Winnipeg throughout those six long weeks? A walking tour reliving the drama and tension of the 1919 Winnipeg general strike. By 11 a.m., everything in Winnipeg had stopped. 30, over 30,000 men, women, and children walked off their jobs that day. It was basically a revolt over poor wages and working conditions. In the post-First World War economy, tensions were high across Canada as returning soldiers struggled to find work. In Winnipeg, it came to a boil. Ethnic tension undercut it all, as Eastern European immigrants were accused of stealing jobs and plotting a socialist revolution. It shut down the city for six weeks until Bloody Saturday, a riot that left two men dead. So how interested are people in this right now, given it's the centennial? Um, actually, a lot. We've been booking since January, which is very exciting. People will really want to learn more. Welcome to the Ukrainian Labour Temple. This is the last remaining building where workers in 1919 met to organize. Workers did not get the gains that they had hoped, but they laid a foundation. Manitoba Labour Federation President Kevin Rebeck says many of the issues they discussed here still resonate. Tensions over migration, governments hostile to labour, and a struggling middle class. The idea that if you worked full time, you shouldn't live in poverty, and that continues to be a call to action that we have today. 
a little 1919 spirit yesterday. Winnipeg bus drivers who have been without a contract staged a one-day job action, not enforcing payment affairs. The building behind us is an old warehouse from 1900. Over a century, a lot has changed in both Winnipeg's downtown and for Canadian workers. Along the tour, so we're gonna loop down, uh, comparisons between then and now are hard to miss. Actually, I think there's remnants of stuff like this happening today. The gap in wealth is still um, very striking to me. You know, not just here, but all over the world. When the strike hit, Winnipeg was in decline. That continued long after. Contentious and divisive, many were happy to see it largely fade into history without much of a public memorial. We're here to talk about Bloody Saturday. That will change next month, with the unveiling of a monument based on this image of the Bloody Saturday riot. I think if anyone knows anything about the strike, it's that photo of the streetcar being tipped over. On her walks, Janky says she believes 1919 is being seen in a new light. I haven't heard a whole lot of, I can't believe they did this. It's normally like, good for Winnipeg, way to go. Striking a legacy, a <laughs> hundred years on. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Our moment is next on The National, how one woman in municipal politics is choosing to make a statement one stitch at a time. I thought, what would happen if I were to knit every time you speak? So I decided to knit in red for men, i.e. stop talking, and green for women, um, talk. Her results and the response she's getting is tonight's moment. But first. In case you missed it, Canadian cameras have been allowed inside Notre Dame Cathedral for the first time since it was devastated by fire a month ago. Members of the media joined Prime Minister Justin Trudeau for a tour of the ruins. And as you can see, while so much was destroyed within the Paris landmark, the bones of the massive structure are standing firm. That's a testament to the strength and the scale of its original construction. Trudeau has pledged Canada's assistance to rebuild. This is truly a piece not just of uh, French history, but of world history that needs to be preserved, and we will be there to be part of it. Now, as for how and when Notre Dame will rise again, French President Emmanuel Macron wants to get it done before the 2024 Paris Olympics, while others would rather take more time just to make sure it's done carefully and thoughtfully. But no one has yet landed on a vision. Even as creative pitches keep rolling in from designers and architects, some of them serious, elegant and complex, while others are... Well, blasphemous is a strong word. Let's call them tongue-in-cheek or not going to happen. Drag is my political statement. Yeah. Let's make a scene. Drag is about creating safe spaces. I didn't choose how I felt. I only had a choice to do something about the way that I felt. I want them to love me. I want them to love drag. A borough mayor in Montreal, it seems, is spending a bit of time knitting a scarf during city council. But her scarf isn't just a scarf, and this isn't just about helping her stay focused. This act, her art, is symbolic of something so much more. Each stitch represents voices in the council meetings. The red yarn for when men speak, and the green for when women speak. Her point and her project is our moment. We're 31 women and 34 men. What I started to notice every month was there's sort of a handful of men who would use up their entire allotted time to speak. And I noticed that when the women speak, uh, they tend to get up, uh, they make their point, and they sit down. I thought, what would happen if I were to knit every time they speak? So I decided to knit in red for men, i.e. stop talking, and green for women, um, talk. And at the end of uh, our two-day council meeting, uh, the majority of my scarf is red. I think I've hit a nerve because I tweeted about this. It's gone absolutely viral. Um, and I just see a lot of women and men to, in some cases saying, hey, we should try this uh, at our university, at our place of work. I don't think it's because we don't speak up. I think just that when we do speak up, uh, we're more efficient. I'm going to keep knitting until Christmas. Uh, we have five more council meetings until then. And so we'll see. Maybe there'll be more green by uh, Christmas. That's what I'm hoping. 
<laughs> so Sue Montgomery says uh, her plan is to auction this off uh, in November, give the money to an organization that uh, helps to empower women. And she says, hey, look, the point is not to shut men up, but maybe just to suggest to them you don't need to talk that much. That is a national for May the 15th. Good night.